In lesson two, we're going to look at how to simplify radicals. So in lesson one, we looked at simplifying radicals by turning um, a radical into a rational exponent. Now we're going to look at keeping these expressions in radical form and simplifying them. Um, and not all of them are going to simplify into perfect squares or perfect cubes. But we're going to look at how can we take out the perfect square, the perfect cube, and simplify the radicals. So a couple of properties that we have to know before we can do this. Um, the first property here is just saying that whenever you have two numbers being multiplied underneath a radical, it's the same thing as splitting up the radicals and multiplying the radicals. So for example, if I had let's say radical 100, this is the same thing as me saying radical 50 times radical 2, breaking it up as 50 times 2, so because I could rewrite this as 50 times 2 underneath the radical, which is the same thing as square root of 100. So it's just saying that you can take anything and you can break it up underneath the radical and rewrite it as two separate radicals. So that's going to be an important property for simplifying. Um, but before we start looking at examples, another property, we kind of used this in the last lesson where we had an example that was like um, square root of 4 over 9. Basically, that's just saying that I can square root each piece, square root the top, square root the bottom, or apply whatever the radical is. If it's the cube root, then you would cube root the top, cube root the bottom, and you would get 2 over 3. Um, and then lastly, before we start looking at examples, whenever we are looking for simplified radicals, in order to be considered simplified form, that means that none of the factors of the radicand or the number underneath the radical can be written as powers greater than or equal to the index. That is, no perfect squares can be factors of the quantity underneath the square root, no perfect cubes can be factors under the cube root, and so forth. So basically, in order to be considered simplified, if we're talking about a square root, we have to take out any perfect squares. If it's a cube root, we have to take out any perfect cubes. If it's a fourth root, we have to take out any perfect fourth roots, and so on. Um, another thing, in order to be simplified, we cannot have any fractions. So no fractions under the radical sign. And this is mainly because we cannot have radicals in the denominator. So there are no radicals in the denominator in order to be considered simplified. So we'll look at basically how to handle each of these and simplify them. So this first example here is radical 50, and it's the square root of 50. So I want to simplify this, and since this is a square root, I'm looking for are there any perfect squares in 50? So you have to think about the factors of 50, or numbers that multiply to give you 50, and you want to break this down into the largest perfect square that goes into 50 and whatever's left over. So the largest perfect square that goes into 50 is going to be 25, and remember, we can using that first property, we can rewrite 50 as a product of 25 and 2. And I purposely choose 25 because it's a perfect square and it's the largest perfect square that multiplies into 50. So then once I rewrite this, now I just square root each piece. Square root 25 is just going to be 5. And the square root of 2 is just going to be left as the square root of 2. So these two expressions are equivalent. So basically, if you wanted to check your answer, you could take the square root of 50 and get some decimal, and then take the square root of 5 times radical 2, or 5 times the square root of 2, and see if the decimals match. And as long as the decimals match, that means you've done it correctly. So this can still apply to um, rational or radicals that have variables as well. So I'm still going to apply the same process where I'm going to break this up into my perfect squares and non-perfect squares since I'm taking the square root. Um, keep in mind in the last lesson, whenever we had a problem like this, we looked at them and 
all of the different pieces just simplified, like they were either perfect squares or perfect cubes depending on the problem, but there wasn't any pieces that did not come out to be um, like a whole number or the exponents worked out perfectly. So in this example, we have to look at 48 first. 48 is not a perfect square, but I can pull out a perfect square from there. So I can figure out the largest perfect square that's a factor of 48, and that's going to be 16. So 16 times 3 is going to give me 48, so I break that down. And then if you remember from the last video, we said that whenever we take the square root of a variable, we basically divide the exponents by 2. So that means x to the fourth is actually going to be a perfect square because I can divide those exponents by 2, or I could rewrite x to the fourth as x squared raised to the second. So it's a perfect square. So that means it's going to go over in this perfect square radical. And then the y to the third, though, if you tried to take the square root of y to the third, it wouldn't come out nicely because the exponent is 3. So when you divide that by 2, it's going to be a fraction or 1.5. So what's going to happen is you need to break apart y to the third. You need to break it apart into a perfect square and then whatever's left over. Or break it up into its factors where one of them is a perfect square. So y to the second is a perfect square where y is what would be left over because if I multiplied y squared times y, I would get y to the third. So my square root of y is just going to be left and I can break down the y squared. So what's going to happen is I'm going to break down this radical here. So I'm going to have square root of 16 is 4. Square root of x to the fourth, remember we divide the exponent by 2. And then y to the second is just going to become y because when you divide that exponent by 2, you get 1. And then I'm left with a radical 3y because that's not going to break down any further. So then that's it for that one. So we're going to look at some more examples. So this example here now is a, per, or, um, a cube root. So we're looking for breaking down perfect cubes versus non-perfect cubes. So instead of looking at exponents that are divisible by 2, now we're looking at exponents so that they're divisible by 3. So first we're going to break down the 40, and you want to think about what factors of 40 um, so that we have the largest perfect cube going into 40. So 8 would be the largest perfect cube that would go into 40, 8 times 5. And remember that these always have to be multiplied. So because of that property saying that you can break up a radical into a product of radicals. So 8 times 5 gives me 40. And now I have to look at the variables. So a is raised to the fifth. But remember, we have to be able to divide it by 3. So that means I need to rewrite this as 8, a to the third. And what would be left over would be a to the second. Remember, your exponents have to add when you're multiplying, so that's why it's a to the third times a to the second, because I would be adding the exponents to get a to the fifth. And then b to the fourth, I can break that down as b to the three, and what would be left over is just a b. So you're trying to figure out the greatest um, exponent that you can have so that when you divide it by three or when you take the cube root, it becomes um, a whole number, so it actually works out. So now I'm going to take the cube root of each piece. The cube root of 8 is 2. The cube root of a to the third is a. Cube root of b to the third is b. Because remember, I'm just dividing those exponents by 3. And then this other stuff I'm just going to leave in the cube root. So that's it for that one. So let's just practice with some more examples. So now I'm back to square roots. It's make, you got to make sure that you're paying attention to whatever the index is, that number by the radical. So here now I'm going back to looking at perfect squares, non-perfect squares, and then I'm also looking at even exponents because you were dividing our exponents by 2 if we're taking the square root. So I have 4 
and 3 as two numbers that multiply to 12, where one of them is the largest perfect square. And then here I'm going to have x to the 6, because that's the highest exponent that I can have that's a multiple of 2, so that I can divide it by 2. And I'm going to be left with an x, since it was x to the 7. And then y to the 6, the whole entire variable can stay in the perfect square category, because 6 is a multiple of 2. So now I'm going to go ahead and reduce that. So square root of 4 is 2. Square root of x to the 6 is going to be x to the 3rd. Same with y. And then we have our square root of 3x left. Then I go over to this next example. Now I have a perfect cube again, or cube root. So now I'm looking for perfect cubes, non-perfect cubes. So perfect cubes. Numbers that go into 54 where I have one of them being a perfect cube. So when I'm looking at perfect cubes, I'm looking at numbers like 1 to the 3rd equals 1. We never really use 1 though because it's not going to get you anywhere. So we kind of just skip over that one. 2 to the 3rd is 8. 3 to the 3rd is 27. So 27 is actually a factor of 54, so I'm going to use that. So 27 times 2. And then I'm going to break up my variables so that they, their exponents are multiples of 3. So this is going to be a to the 6. I don't have to write anything over on the other side. b to the 2nd is going to have to just go in the non-perfect cube radical because none I can't break it up and get um, a multiple of 3. And then c is going to be c to the 3rd and left over with c so that it stays c to the 4th if I were to multiply them, but I have my perfect cube over here. So now I can break this down. This cube root of 27 is 3. The cube root of a to the 6 will be a to the 2nd because I'm dividing that 6 by 3 since I'm taking the cube root. And then I'm going to be left with 2b squared times c. So now looking at some other simplifying problems. So where, if you remember that second property of a simplified radical is that you can't have any fractions left in radicals. So I have to take care of the fraction here underneath the radical. So if you remember, whenever you're taking the radical of a fraction, it really means you split it up. You can take the square root of the, the numerator over the square root of the denominator, which ends up being the square root of 3 because that's not going to reduce nicely. Square root of 4 is 2. So we can leave it like this. It's just we can't have the square root of a fraction. So this is fine because it's still a fraction, but only the numerator has a square root in it. So looking at this next one, so this means the square root of 5 over the square root of 6. Now in this case, the square root of 6 doesn't come out nicely. There's no way for me to break that up. So in order to eliminate having an entire fraction underneath the square root, what I need to do is what we call rationalize which really means get rid of the square root in the denominator. Because if you remember, that was that third rule that you can't have a square root in the denominator. So to avoid this entire thing being under a radical and to avoid the square root being in the denominator, what you can do is you can multiply the top and the bottom by whatever the square root of the denominator is. This process is called rationalizing the denominator. So rationalizing the denominator. So what happens is when you multiply these, remember that property from the beginning of the lesson where whenever you have a product of two radicals, it's the same thing as multiplying what's underneath the radical. So 5 times 6 gives me 30. We just saw it as breaking it up the opposite way. We were starting with the square root of 30, and we would have broke it up into the square root of 5 and square root of 6. But it works both ways. So then down below here, we have the square root of 6 times the square root of 6 is going to be the square root of 
36, which you might be thinking, well, how did that help? Because now I still have a square root in the denominator. But what happened is, since you multiplied by the same number in the denominator, you ended up with a perfect square in the denominator. So when you take the square root of 36, you end up with 6 and no longer a radical in the denominator. So basically, you force the denominator to become a perfect square by multiplying by whatever is in the denominator. So when you rationalize, you always have to multiply by whatever the radical is in the denominator so that you get this perfect square, so that when you take the square root, it becomes 6, or it becomes a whole number. Now, if you were to take the, if you had a perfect cube in the denominator, you would have to multiply by something so that when you get your new denominator with the cube root, you end up canceling it out. So you're going to have to multiply by basically the perfect cube of that. So we'll see an example with that in a minute. So let's do a couple more of these. So here we're just rationalizing the denominator, so that just means multiply by the square root of whatever is in the denominator. So we get 4 radical 3 on top. And basically what's going to always happen is the bottom is going to become a perfect square, which the perfect square will always evaluate to whatever was under the radical to begin with. So since radical 3 times radical 3 is 9, since I multiplied a radical by itself twice, I essentially squared it, and squaring and, rad and a square root undo each other, so that's why I get back to 3. So you really don't have to show this in-between step. That's just optional for you to show. So let's look at the next one. So here, now we have a variable in the denominator with it, but it's going to be the same process. You're going to multiply everything by the square root of 5y, so you're going to end up with, up top, 2, and remember, under the radical, you just multiply. So in the next one here, notice that I have a cube root. So like I was saying previously, you're still going to have to be multiplying by a cube root, but the question is, what goes underneath the cube root? So if you think about it, I need to be able to multiply 4 and something else so that when I take the cube root of those, it comes out to be a whole number. So basically, if you take the cube root of 4 squared, and you multiply it by the cube root of 4, those will end up canceling because when you do 4 times 4 to the second, it's really 4 to the third. So when you take the cube root of 4 to the third, you'd be left with just 4. So whenever it's a cube root or another root, you always have to multiply by that number, but you have to multiply it by the number to an exponent that's one less than whatever the root is. So when I go to simplify this, I'm going to get 7 cube root of 16. And then below, I'm going to have the cube root of 4 raised to the third. Now I could multiply those out, but I just wanted to show you that since I have 4 to the third and a cube root, those cancel each other out. So I, I ended up with 7 cube root of 16 over 4. So you have to multiply by an exponent that's going to cancel that root out. Now if you look, I'm left with 16 up top. 16 has a perfect cube in it, so I need to simplify this further. So I'm going to just do this cube root off to the side. So perfect cube, non-perfect cube. So the perfect cube in 16 is going to be 8, and I'll be left with 2. When I take the cube root of 8, I'm left with 2, so it'll be 2 cube root of 2. So then I can go up here and I can put in replace of this cube root of 16, I'm going to replace that with 2 cube root of 2 all over 4. Notice that I kept this multiplication because it's really 7 times this cube root. Um, 
And then I have some things that I can cancel. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel this two. So that will become a one and then this will become a two down here. So I'm going to be left with seven cube root of two all over two. And one last example here. So now I have kind of a combination of everything where I have a fraction. I have some simplifying I have to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just rewrite this whole thing as two separate radicals. Whenever you have a fraction, rewrite it as your two separate radicals. So I have the square root on top and the square root on the bottom. So then what that means is I'm going to have to rationalize because I can't have that square root of 5z on the bottom. But before we rationalize, I think it's going to be easier if we simplify that top piece. So off to the top or off to the side, I'm going to simplify that numerator. So I have my perfect square, non-perfect square. So perfect square that goes into 12 is going to be 4, so 4 times 3. Even exponents here, so x to the 4th and just x, y to the 2nd and y. So when I simplify, I'm going to have 2x to the 2nd y, square root of 3xy. So I'm going to take that, I'm going to replace it. So I have 2x squared y, square root 3xy all over square root of 5z and now we're going to rationalize so multiply top and bottom by square root of 5z so we have 2x squared y underneath the radical we multiply 3xy and 5z so I have 15xyz multiplying all of those in the denominator, I'm going to have 5z because I'm multiplying 5z times 5z, which is 25z squared. Square root that, you get 5z. So here is my final answer.